So welcome everyone today to our presentation on how to invite roadrunners to your yard. Um, we're joined here today by Jenny McFarland uh, and Kimberly Matsushino. Um, they both work for Tucson Audubon and uh, are going to help us learn how to um, get these really enigmatic birds um, to come visit our yards more often. Uh, I'll go ahead and turn it over to them. Jenny, Kim, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kirsten. Okay, so I'm Jenny McFarland and Kim Mastrestino will be presenting as well towards the end. And this is, uh, thank you for joining us today. This is part of our series focusing on our recipe card documents. And this is the one specifically we're talking about, the Greater Roadrunner Recipe Cards. So these are handouts that we've developed. Uh, we have 10 of them now uh, on how to advise people on how to make their yard good for a particular bird or category of bird or animal. So we have like crested cuties for uh, Northern Cardinal, Pyroloxia and Phanopepla and things like Lucy's Warbler, a pollinator's card, and this is the Greater Roadrunners card, which focuses a lot on roadrunners, the native plants they like, as well as uh, the lizards on which they depend. So that's gonna be much of what our talk is about today. All right, so let me uh, share my screen here. Share screen, screen one, share sound, share, okay. Oh shoot, okay, let me unshare. I forgot it does that. All right, always wants to do my screen too. There we go, okay. Okay, so can you guys see that okay? The cover Great. screen? Okay, so Greater Roadrunners, a recipe for success. So that's a, a joke off of our, our recipe card concept. And uh, greater roadrunners are kind of a tricky one. And they're one of the animals I feel like I get asked about the most. Um, when people call Tucson Audubon, a lot of those phone calls come to, to Kim and myself about how to get birds in your yard or where to go find birds. And, and roadrunners is one that people ask about all the time. People are totally charmed and, and really want to see greater roadrunners and they are incredibly charismatic. And um, part of that is this lovely scenery that we see here on our cover screen. They are such a symbol of the Sonoran Desert and they're just a really cool dynamic bird. And we're gonna learn a lot more about that. So they are a celebrity bird. I would say you could pretty well justify calling them one of the most famous animals of the Sonoran Desert. They are very well known. I would hazard to, to claim internationally well-known. They're iconic animals of this region and they're fascinating. Their behavior is really cool. The fact they, they do do this behavior, like in this photo of literally running on a road, road running is uh, also, I think, very charismatic. People tend to see them. You know, they, they're, they're in areas near roads and on roads and then people encounter them. They are excellent hunters and are famous for taking many types of prey. They'll famously fight, kill, and then eat rattlesnakes. Uh, many other prey too, they really do seem to prefer reptiles. They go for a lot of lizards and snakes, but they'll take pretty much anything they can catch. I've seen footage of roadrunners taking small birds. I've heard stories of them going after hummingbirds, like some individual roadrunners will learn how to, how to hang out underneath a hummingbird feeder, remain motionless, and then jump up and grab hummingbirds as they hover. It seems to be very much a specific individual. Only some roadrunners seem to learn how to do that. They do need rather large territories. They can adapt to urban areas uh, if adjacent natural habitat or there's a block of, of excellent yards. And that's one of the reasons we did a recipe card about them because we wanted all the recipe cards to sort of coordinate and work together where if people follow the, the advice of planting those natives and doing some of the other procedures advised that over time they would develop a really good yard that was good for a lot of things. So roadrunners are kind of a, a, a more advanced kind of upper tier bird to try to achieve for your yard because they need large territories and they have pretty sophisticated needs in terms of a bio rich yard. And they're also an absolute favorite animal of the public. So they're just really good outreach ambassadors for why a healthy bio rich yard full of native plants is good for you and good for wildlife. 
They're also an absolute pop culture icon. This is the Roadrunner from Warner Brothers that I would argue has definitely added to uh, the fame of the animal. Uh, they're not blue. They don't run in a, a, a whirring wheel with NASCAR smoke coming out the back. And they don't really seem to battle coyotes. Though I have occasionally seen a Roadrunner or a coyote together, which is always just the best. But uh, this definitely helped fixate them into what most people think about when they think of the desert is Roadrunners. And that is nothing new. Uh, Roadrunners have been part of indigenous culture of the American Southwest for many, many generations. And these are just two legends of Roadrunners that uh, I was able to find from the Southwest, from uh, Arizona and Texas. So the, the Hopi had a Roadrunner Kachina. So Kachina being the uh, you know, religious deities of the, the Hopi people where they do the religious dancing and also have the Hopi dolls. One of them is Hospa, who is the Kachina that guards against guards the Hopi people against witchcraft and other negative forces. So it's very much a protector of uh, character. And they use actual Roadrunner feathers are preferred for prayer plumes, the Hopi people. So Roadrunners are very important to the Hopi, but also the Tejas, a Kadona people of East Texas. And the name of their tribe means friend. And it's actually the origin of the name of the state of Texas. So the Tejas people is where Texas gets its name. And they have this great story of uh, sort of a really amazing legend of Rattlesnake and Roadrunner, who Roadrunner's name is Pisano, and they were friends early on. And Rattlesnake carries messages from the great spirit who is known as uh, the serpent with bells, the rattlesnake. And he carries messages from the great spirit to like the chief. Those are important messages. And because he is so um, dangerous and can really take care of himself as a rattlesnake, no one dares impede him. So he is the messenger, the serpent with bells. But the roadrunner, his friend who is curious and eavesdropping overhears the message that the snake receives and he carries it to the chief faster than the rattlesnake and then takes over his role as messenger. So kind of usurps that role and that makes rattlesnake very angry and rattlesnake attacks roadrunner's babies and roadrunner attacks rattlesnake and they're still locked in combat as these enemies who were formerly friends. So I thought that was a really interesting, really cool story of because uh, rattlesnakes and roadrunners still fight today they are enemies who attack each other and try to sort of attack each other and they're they're young so it's that was a really engaging story i thought but there's there's a lot more of these sorts of legends but these are just two of the ones i encountered so back to to roadrunners themselves roadrunners surprisingly to some people are actually part of the cuckoo family and this is quite a large family. So cuckoos have 147 species of cuckoo around the world. And there are many continents that are obviously here, North America with, with our several cuckoo species, including Greater Roadrunner. They're in uh, South America, Central America. There's even cuckoos in Africa and Asia. So they're really, and of course, Europe as well, the uh, Oriental cuckoo, but they're really, um, diverse family. Cuckoos take on a lot of different forms. But so the ones that we encounter often here in North America are the cuckoos like the yellow-billed cuckoo. So this is sort of a group of cuckoos and yellow-billed is one we've been doing a lot of work with at Tucson Audubon where they come, they migrate up to North America all the way from South America, highly migratory birds and hang out in the riparian zones. And cuckoos, at first you think roadrunners are cuckoos, but then if you really kind of look at these two cuckoos, we have a squirrel cuckoo here on the left, which you can see in Mexico, I've seen in Mexico, all the way down to South America, and which is structurally pretty similar to our yellow-billed cuckoo. But if you look at the bill and sort of the long slender body and the really long tail, they hold their bodies very differently, but they're actually kind of similar to roadrunners. You can see how roadrunners would be you know, kin to these birds. They have the same zygodactyl feet, which means two toes pointing forward and two toes pointing back, which is a really uh, important hallmark of all cuckoos. All the cuckoo birds have that. And uh, you can really see that in roadrunners with their tracks. If you ever see their tracks on the ground, like in the dust in the bottom of a wash or something, 
their tracks make an X because it's two toes forward and two toes back. And it's called zygodactyl. And all the cuckoos have that, including yellow-billed cuckoo, squirrel cuckoo. Another question I get a lot is the fact that the bird is called greater roadrunner implies, is there a lesser roadrunner? And the answer is yes, <laughs> there is a bird known as the lesser roadrunner. It is very similar to the greater roadrunner. It's a sister species. And perhaps unsurprisingly by the name, it is smaller than the greater roadrunner. So lesser is smaller. And that's all they mean by lesser is literally its size. They're smaller. It is have a little bit of plumage differences. It uh, has no streaking on the throat or breast. Below, it's buffy instead of white. It's kind of a beige instead of white. It occupies arid scrub and other dry open habitats uh, in Mexico, going down towards Central America. And from everything I could find about lesser roadrunners, implied to me that they're relatively underknown. Uh, they don't. They don't have a very. They have a pretty long range, kind of big range and their population seems to be very steady, but it's not as big a geographic area as the greater roadrunner and it's not encountered as much. So they have kind of a limited elevation. They tend to be below 3000 feet down to sea level and they really like arid scrub and dry open habitats, which is also similar to greater roadrunner. So uh, that's a big question I get a lot. If there's a greater, is there a lesser? And the answer is, is yes. And it just looks sort of like Greater Roadrunners, sort of little brother. They're very, they're a little bit smaller, and um, they're kind of cute. I thought, looked all the pictures I found of them. They were really very, also charismatic and engaging, like the Greater Roadrunner. Here's another really cool bird that I think, if you've been to the tropics at all, you may have encountered ground cuckoos, which is a category of that the large, that very large cuckoo family that seems to be closest to Greater Roadrunner. I mean, they they certainly look quite a lot like a really fancy Roadrunner. They have that similar uh, posture and structure with the large bill and a crest that they can raise and lower at will and a long, almost rooster-like tail coming out the back. Uh, they are different from our Greater Roadrunner though in that they're very secretive. They're really hard to spot. I found very few photos of these birds. They're very elusive. They're really shy. They do hunt a lot of uh, prey, and that's a that's something that many many of these cuckoos will share. I and mean, I've seen yellow bill cuckoo taking lizards and frogs and and sort of prey like that. They're very sort of prey hunting oriented birds. All the cuckoos, and they are very secretive and elusive. These guys will follow carpets of army ants to forage. So as little creatures, you know, reptiles and things flee before this carpet of ants in the tropics, uh, these ground cuckoos will will hunt them. And they really occupy dense understory of the lowland broadleaf forest. And there's many types of ground cuckoos. There's a lot of species, but they're so secretive that many of them even didn't have any photos of some of these species of ground cuckoo. And Rufus vented seems to be still quite secretive, but one that's encountered a bit more than others. And what a little beauty. It looks like such a fancy little, like almost pheasant-like roadrunner. Really, really cute bird. So I just wanted to bring up the fact that ground cuckoo is a sort of a category, there's, there's several species of ground cuckoos that really seem pretty darn close to Roadrunner. But back to our part of the, our neck of the woods here, the Sonoran Desert uh, is a wonderful area here. And if in, we're here in Tucson or Southeast Arizona, and Sonoran Desert is very iconic and prominent here. And one of the most iconic animals we have, of course, is the greater Roadrunner. But it actually has a range of distribution beyond the Sonoran Desert. So um, it's quite a large range actually, and this pretty much is outlining what I would kind of call the desert and scrub regions of um, North America. So we have some range into California, most of Arizona up into just avoiding sort of the, the three corners area, the four corners area, much of New Mexico, pretty much all of Texas, Oklahoma, all the way over to Louisiana and Missouri can be the range of Greater Roadrunner down into extensively through Mexico as well. Um, now over the last 20th century, or last century, the 20th century, the range of this bird has actually extended, it's expanded north and eastward. And this is reflected in this map. So this, the Northern range and the, the Eastern edges are, are new. Within the, as far as we know, within the 20th century. And that's attributed to um, land changes. So land clearance and overgrazing followed by a reinvasion of shrubby species are probably factors in some of this range expansion. But they've also lost some ground too. So especially in California, 
they've been extirpated, which means they no longer occur, almost like extinct locally within uh, several of California counties. Like you don't find them in San Diego County anymore. Uh, a few of these other counties that used to historically had greater roadrunners just don't anymore in California. And it seems to be that's linked to all sorts of land changes where residential and agricultural development has been extensive, so much so that the roadrunners can't use those areas anymore. Now, Ebert has these other maps that you can access that are density maps that don't just show the footprint of where these different birds occur, but show the density at which they occur. So we can see here that range map that showed all this Eastern extension through you know, East Texas, all the way to Louisiana, that that's actually, they're far less common out there. So they, they do, you can encounter them out there, but this map is showing just sort of by the shade of purple that uh, they're most abundant in Southeast Arizona and down into the Sierra Madre of Mexico, South of Arizona, and then extreme Southern New Mexico, quite extensively in West Texas, and then down into Mexico as well, and then Baja. So these are the areas where they're most um, densely population, you know, the populations are densest, and they are year-round resident. They don't migrate. They will move around. I have, I have seen roadrunners more common at different elevations than others throughout the year, uh, but that's probably breeding driven, and they don't migrate in the traditional sense. They're in there, the region they're in, they're in there year round. And they're never really hugely abundant roadrunners. They're always kind of relatively spread out and thin on the ground. They need a lot of space, each pair does. So they're rare to uncommon through that Northern and Eastern portion of the range, but even where they're common, they're never like super common. And which is what you kind of expect from a predator species. And coastal Texas and Mexico, um, they can be, uh, pretty common and they're common to frequent in Mojave Desert, Sonoran Desert, Chihuahuan Desert. So they're very much a desert adapted bird and the Tamalupe and Thorn regions of the, the Southwest, US Southwest and Mexico. So the regions where we have them that are desert is where they seem to be most abundant and most common. So greater roadrunners really are such amazing birds. Uh, again, they're this year round resident, which is really, I think why they're so restricted to these really much pretty warm areas. Uh, if it was too cold, their prey base wouldn't be available year round and they're not a bird that migrates. So they have to be in areas where they can get very, very abundant prey during the breeding season, but have enough prey to survive year round. Uh, they do are typically, they do typically occur in semi-arid and arid open country with scattered scrub. They need it to be relatively open and they, they seem to really prefer a sh like a, a shrub level of low to 50% cover. They can't have an area that's too dense. And part of that is just the, their ability to move around. And I would also postulate a big part of that is that's gonna be the healthiest areas for reptiles. So, which is their main prey base. So they're common in lower Sonoran Desert as well as upper. So what I mean by that is so, so lower Sonoran Desert is what you encounter more in like the Phoenix area and upper Sonora being more what's in the Tucson area. So it has to do with just slight elevation changes Upper Sonoran tends to be more lush and gets more rainfall and has more trees associated with it and a higher just diversity of birds and wildlife overall. Although Lower Sonoran is also still quite diverse for a desert habitat, but Upper Sonoran is about as wet as desert can get and still remain desert. So kind of the lushest of deserts is Upper Sonoran, which is pretty much personified by what we get around Tucson. And uh, greater roadrunners are also most frequently associated with a brush layer that's about two to three meters high. So they can't, they need some structure, but too much structure, too much dense vegetation is just not gonna work for them and they are gonna avoid areas like that. So they do pretty well in suburban areas. Like before this uh, meeting started, we were talking about uh, amongst ourselves about how people are seeing them in their yards which is another reason we really wanted to prioritize this species for our recipe card series. Cause you can, you can do things, if, especially if you live in a less densely urban area, you can get roadrunners in your yard and they do quite well in suburban areas. I have seen them in urban zones, but they're probably passing through. So they don't so much, they're not so much likely to spend a lot of time or nest in a densely urban area, but they certainly can come through. And if, you, if your yard, even if you live very urban, if your yard is quite productive and full of native plants and taking other steps to make it uh, hospitable for roadrunners, you really could have them at least stopping by as they're on their way um, somewhere else. 
Roadrunners are very, very prey focused. They are excellent hunters. They are very, very skilled, formidable hunters. It really does put one in mind of watching a small dinosaur attack prey. And they act like a velociraptor in the movie Jurassic Park, the way they will chase down on foot lizards, you know, and then stand perfectly still and sort of ambush these lizards and just take them out with that very large, formidable bill that they have. Uh, they're very cool, very effective, efficient hunters, especially of reptiles, um, lizards and snakes. They'll take a lot of things too, but, and 90% of their diet turns out to be uh, prey, prey that they've taken. They'll also take large insects and things like that too. Uh, lots of, lots of anything they can catch is pretty much on the menu. And they do also eat fruit and seeds, especially of cacti. And that makes up about 10% of their diet. They are quite noisy. They're not songbirds. Cuckoos in general, after uh, my experience, having a lot of experience with yellow book cuckoos, which make a lot of really weird sounds. Greater roadrunners make quite a lot of weird sounds. I think this is something of, of the cuckoo family in general. Very loud, strident sounds is something that they really do. I mean, the cuckoo clock sound, cuckoo is from the, um, the European cuckoo, and it literally sounds exactly like that. So cuckoos make a lot of weird sounds, and roadrunners are no exception. So one that we get a lot of calls about, especially in the spring, I will hear people will, it's one of my favorite games that happens at Tucson Audubon, and I imagine many nature shops or any shop that focuses on birds, is when people come in and they try to make the sound of something. They'll be like, it sounds like this, and they're, they're making a sound, and, um, and it's like, I don't know if you guys have used to listen to like click and clack on NPR, but it's a lot like that, where people are making sounds with their phones and they're trying to get you to diagnose their car by sounds. People want you to try to identify birds as they imitate the sounds. And honestly, I love it. It's one of my favorite things that happens. And many times I, I can't figure it out, but when you can, it's the best. And one that we get a lot is people will call with a description of a sound they're hearing from the desert. Like, I know it's not a puppy, but I'm hearing this like puppy sound. It's like whimper sound from the desert and it must be a bird, but do you know what it is? And it sounds like this. So this is called the coo call and it sounds so sad when you hear it, the coo call and it is produced only by the male and it's accompanied by an elaborate head movement uh, with a crest fully erect where they can literally, and you may have seen this if you've ever seen roadrunners running around um, an area like a yard or a, like a park or garden or just desert habitat, that crest on top of their head, their feathers on their crown, they can raise them at will and make them quite tall. And when the male's doing that coo puppy sound, uh, he is raising his crest. And there's another call that I have heard less frequently and it apparently is more rare to hear, which is the bark call. Let's listen to that. <laughs> And it sounds like a gibbon or something out in the desert. <laughs> I have heard this, I knew it was Roadrunners, but I didn't know until recently that, uh, first of all, it's quite loud. It can be heard up to 300 meters away, whereas the coo is much quieter. And if you hear the coo, the Roadrunners are probably pretty close. But the bark um, is given only by the female and carries quite a long way. Now, the bill clatter, which we heard a snippet of at the end of that, um, that bark call we just heard, is given by... Um, the uh, female, but the bill clatter can be either. And I'm looking for something specific here. So I have a video I want to show you guys real quick of, uh, um, I hate the way this happens. Sorry, the, the Zoom covers what I'm trying to do. Okay, there we go. So here's a bill clatter. And it's kind of funny because it's really, you have to see it to fully understand the bill clatter. <laughs> so here we go. That's pretty cool, the bill clatter call. So that's um, something that yellow bill cuckoos will do as well, the bill clatter like that. But both male and female will do that. I'm not really sure what it means. I hear it a lot. You hear it a lot when we're out doing bird surveys. It, it must be maybe a communication thing between male and female, almost like a call. 
but they do it a lot. So some of it seems to be voice. They're making that sort of almost like a guttural coo and then followed by the physical clattering of their upper and lower mandibles. That's, that's pretty cool. Okay. There we go. So cuckoo's on the move. So, so cuckoo's the way they, the way greater roadrunners move is one of the many dynamic things about them. And Warner Brothers had that right with the Roadrunner in that they are very, very fast. They can maintain a running speed of over 30 kilometers per hour over distance. So that's not just a burst of speed. They can do that over considerable um, lengths of, of, of distance. And when they run at top speed, they have a sort of a physical um, like stance they go into, they'll hold their head and tail parallel to the ground. And this is fun. I've seen them do this. Many people, if you've ever seen them running along a road, this is what they're usually doing is they, they kind of make themselves almost flat as they run. And when they need to change direction quickly, like when they're hunting or trying to catch a lizard, they'll swing that long tail from side to side. And it puts me in mind of nature videos I've seen of like cheetahs hunting, where they're using their tail as like a counterweight or a rudder when they're changing directions at high speed. It's, it's absolutely astonishing to watch. And they're really quite amazing at long distance, very fast running over flat ground. It's really very cool. And they like to move quickly. That's part of their strategy. So they frequently use roads, well-beaten paths, or dry stream beds as sort of travel corridors, almost like trails and routes. They can't fly. That's a question I get a lot. Can roadrunners fly? And the answer is yes. They are infrequently observed flying short distances. They're not great at it, but they can do it. And uh, for instance, like someone was saying early on that uh, one crossing the road right in front of their car and then it flew to escape uh, getting run over. So they will fly in a pinch. I've seen them flutter up when they're, when they're trying to take on a snake so that they can kind of change their angle quickly and confuse the snake. I've seen them flutter up to roofs or treetops. I mean, if you've ever seen them on a roof like this one, like this guy launching off a roof, I and mean, they got up there somehow. Now, some of it could be hopping up a tree, but they can fly pretty well. They're kind of like chickens. I was thinking of them as like chickens. They can fly, but they prefer not to, and they don't really fly over long distances. So another really dynamic thing that people, especially I feel like birders who are out early, because this tends to happen early in the morning, will encounter roadrunners doing the sunbathing behavior where they'll literally sunbathe. They'll orient their back perpendicular to the sun. So they'll, they'll turn their back towards the rising sun and they will lift the feathers on their back to get some nice sun rays hitting their very dark skin. They have their skin, their physical skin under their feathers is black. And they, it acts like a solar panel and they lift their feathers and they have very dark colored feathers, you know, under their main feathers on their back, but also their black skin soaks up the, the warmth of the sun. Now, I've seen roadrunners do this a lot. Many of us probably have. They do tend to do it kind of sitting up on top of a fence post or a rooftop or where I've seen them do it a lot is on top of a mesquite like into sort of this mesquite grasslands area where I, I encounter them a lot. Like for instance, when you're driving up to Madera Canyon, I've frequently been like, what is that? On top of a mesquite, you know, 10 feet up in a mesquite facing the sun. And it's a roadrunner that's doing this behavior. But I, I had to do some research to kind of get to the bottom of, of why they do this. I mean, obviously they're warming up, but I was curious if there was a bigger picture at play. And it turns out there is. So roadrunners do this as part of an adaptation they have where they can lower their body temperature at night. So it uses a lot of energy, burns a lot of calories to maintain your body temperature when it gets colder, right? I mean, that's true of us, it's true of, of any of these hot blooded animals. So roadrunners and hummingbirds do this as well, but more extremely. So when hummingbirds need to rest overnight and they can't, they don't have enough calories in their system to keep their body temperature as high as it usually is overnight, they will go into what's called torpor. So it's like a mini overnight hibernation almost. So the, the metabolism decreases, the heart rate decreases, everything decreases and they go into almost like a semi hibernation. And then in the morning they have to wake up. So hummingbirds will do this sort of by shivering in the morning uh, to get back up to temperatures where their muscles are working again and that they can then go 
go feed and forage. Roadrunners do a less extreme version of this. They lower their body temperature and, and sort of all their functions slow down overnight to save calories. And they have to warm up again in the morning. They can't really run around effectively or act or move quickly until they've warmed up. Now, roadrunners are not as worried about predators as many other birds. Very few things predate roadrunners. It does happen. Uh, there's been some documented cases, but it's not common. Roadrunners are pretty large. They're pretty, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Confident birds. And they have to warm up again. So they, it takes them half as many calories to warm up if they use this sun strategy than if they were to sort of shiver their way back to uh, an increased body temperature, a normal body temperature. So they do this as the strategy of recovering, coming out of torpor in a way that is very energy efficient where they don't have to burn as many calories getting back up to temperature. I thought that was so cool. I didn't know road runners went into torpor at night. Uh, so that was, I was really, really impressed by that. I do have one more video, let me pull that up. Uh, it's a video of a road runner doing this behavior of warming up. You haven't seen that it's really worth looking. The video has obviously taken the bears on it. The bird's calling. Really fluff up and turn that back. Done. They're literally lifting. I'm taking this moment to preen as well while the warm. But I thought that was pretty cool. Okay. So this also leads us to one of the other really interesting things that's happened, I think, with Tucson Audubon. Back in the day when we started giving quite a lot of talks, one of the most popular talks we gave was on Greater Roadrunners. And I gotta give a shout out to Doris Evans here because she, she contributes a lot of great photos to Tucson Audubon and graciously lets us use her photos and sometimes her videos. She's a wonderful photographer here in Tucson. And Doris gave that talk years ago and I attended, I just started working at Tucson Audubon over 10 years ago. And Doris gave this great talk on Roadrunners. And it was at that time, it was a real game changer for us because it was the, one of the most attended talks we ever gave. Remember when talks were in person back in the day? <laughs> so 10 years ago. And people were it totally head over heels in love with roadrunners. And Doris had had a pair of roadrunners nest in her yard. And she's an amazing photographer. So she got all this great footage and photos of roadrunners, sort of an intimate look at roadrunners nesting. And so a lot of these photos we have that she started on uses are from Doris. So a special shout out to Doris. And but roadrunners, the nesting that they do really is really pretty amazing. Their relationship is really amazing. I do often see roadrunners in pairs, not always, but I often do see them together, especially in the spring. And that actually makes total sense when I research them. They're incredibly monogamous. A pair will stay together for life, uh, almost always. They have a very strong pair bond. And every year they do pair bonding uh, behaviors and displaying. And they, they start when, when they're getting ready to nest again, they'll hunt together and do sort of like sort of like couples activities to to strengthen their bond and they really do have this very social kind of sweet like pair relationship and then when they're when they're ready to nest they be, do their nest building usually in March if you have eggs April through May it's highly variable they're very adaptable birds so it's based on the conditions of what's going on if there's a lot of good winter rain they might nest earlier if not so much they might nest later uh, and they may also sometimes do a second nest if a monsoon is quite good uh, so in the summer, like a July, August nest, they do prefer a cluster of trees along a wash or a path um, or like a trail, that kind of thing near grassy areas. And the area has to be very bio rich. There has to be a really substantial prey base for them to uh, feed those young. They too tend to nest in a tree or a thorny shrub, uh, which is what a lot of the, the plants we focus on the recipe card, a lot of them are nest substrate plants. And they will also nest in choya. They've been documented quite frequently, especially in Arizona, nesting right in a choya. So a lot of it's about protection. They got to keep those babies safe while they're so small, they can't defend themselves. They tend, the nest tends to be about one to three meters above the ground. They can lay three to six eggs and maybe more. And in, in times of great abundance, uh, biologists have documented nests with more than six eggs. So they can, if there's a lot of food around. 
And both parents, both mom and dad will brood and will feed the young. And the young fledge at 21 days, that's pretty darn fast. So that's a feature that most cuckoos have, most of the members of the cuckoo family, I think maybe all, their young grow incredibly quickly. Now, cuckoos are also famous for nest parasitism, right? So things like the European cuckoo famously lay their eggs in the nests of other birds. Uh, Roadrunners don't do that. yellow billed cuckoos pretty much don't do that. But so our North American cuckoos are not so much parasitic like the ones in, in Europe and Asia, but they are closely related and they do have that similar adaptation of their young growing very, very quickly, which nest parasites have for an obvious reason, but it benefits these, these uh, other cuckoo species that take care of their own young because their young are getting big and they're growing very, very rapidly, which is gonna be a big advantage if you're worried about getting them out of the nest where they're vulnerable to predators. So here's a really nice video by Doris of that roadrunner pair that was in her yard. So we're gonna watch with those. Mom or dad bringing a big lizard. Here's the other, the, the mate sitting on the nest, covering the babies with their wings, which coming though do they shake the babies with their wings. Gets out of the way, gives the giant lizard to one of the babies. It looks so big. How on earth is that roadrunner gonna swallow that whole lizard? It looks like it takes a few minutes. It's kind of choking on it, but it, it's trying. And we look close at this video and there's six babies in this nest at least. We can see at least easily, you know, very accurately see six and there may be more, but there's at least six young in here. And that baby's trusting. We just gotta get it down. Cool. I was really struck too by how much these babies look like roadrunners their bills and all that start growing pretty quickly. We've got these, this pin feather thing coming into with yellow book cuckoos have a feather sheet where they grow their feathers very quickly. Another cuckoo adaptation of just growing up quick to get out of that mess. Now just the tail sticking out. a second but it mostly got that that lizard down Oof. so they're pretty dynamic birds they're pretty great so moving through the recipe card uh, all of our recipe cards feature native plants on the back it's sort of uh the most recommended plants for that that category or species of bird or wildlife and uh a lot of these plants on the back of the roadrunner card are incredibly spiky because that is what roadrunners really favor in terms of nesting structure. And it's also can be very important for lizards as well. So the first bird is canyon hat, or bird, first plant is canyon hackberry, which does very well in Tucson, Green Valley, you know, any of these sort of lower elevation areas. It's really important nectar and larval food plant for many species of pollinator. So that's the thing we found when we were putting these recipe cards together is that many of these plants are absolute superstars in terms of putting them in their yard. If you put it in your yard because you want to encourage roadrunners, that's great. But you're gonna also benefit tons of other things, which is eh, just so great about native plants. So they're really important food so fruit source, which can be quite an important thing to have here in the desert because fruit is can be hard to encounter, hard to come by. It's dense shelter for nesting birds as well, especially you know roadrunners will favor this, but lots of things will nest in Canyon Hackberry. It's very dense shade, and it's really important cover for lizards and others. So anything that has long spines sticking out, but but nice and smooth. Um, the branches themselves not being spiky or the trunks not being so spiky, that's really important for lizards because they can get in there without being injured, but it keeps larger things from attacking them. And then of course, it makes a lot of leaf litter, which is important for insects and lizards. So Choya, the thorny fortress. Uh, so Choya is one that we think about a lot with cactus wrens and curbal thrashers, and that photo actually has a cactus wren in the Choya, but it's really important cover for all sorts of nesting um, birds and animals, and especially big ones for roadrunners. It's also really good lizard cover. Lizards will hang out under Choya to stay, safe, to stay safe from predators. It's very hardy and drought resistant. The flowers are really important for native bees and many different species will utilize the Choya. So a lot of people don't like Choya in their yard, which I fully understand. But one of the most creative uh, solutions I heard to Choya is putting it along a back wall 
that this homeowner was concerned of people hopping over the wall because it like it was a back wall to an alley. So they put Choi along that back wall uh, and they had a lovely safe wall after that, as well as some nice bird habitat. So it can take some real thought to keep Choi away from you know, your dogs or away from where like your children play, but you can integrate it into your landscape. And if you're willing to, it can be very beneficial. So creosote is a really important plant. It's a keystone plant. And you wouldn't think so. A lot of, a lot of locals may think Choya, or excuse me, may think of creosote as a relatively useless plant. I've heard people call it useless. And it's actually a very important plant. It's very hardy and drought tolerant. It has really important um, like leaf litter and cover for lizards. And it's a really important shade plant for a lot of animals. You see quail and all sorts of things hanging out under a creosote. It's not spiny, so it makes good roosting habitat for a lot of a lot of animals, but it's very dense and shady and the leaves are incredibly waxy and drought resistant. And it's an important nectar source too for many pollinators. And a few, a few, it's a larval host for a few pollinators. And rodents tend to make burrows around the roots. And you'll see this a lot, if you just look around in the desert, you'll see a lot of rodent burrows underneath the roots of creosote. They seem to select for this. And those burrows, especially once they're kind of old and abandoned by the rodents, are a really important resource for lizards. They need, it's kind of like a perfect lizard-sized cave for them to hide in if something's chasing them or if they need to hide from the sun. If it's getting too hot and they need to go underground, old rodent burrows are great for them. There's a really important like resource that lizards look for. And also um, creosote makes that lovely rain smell. And if we want to smell that more in Tucson, we got to plant some creosote. Gray thorn is another absolutely armored plant. It's a thorn fortress. It's wonderful protection for nesting birds. Roadrunners will nest within it. It's a reliable fruit source. Again, it's that fruit is really important for a lot of birds and wildlife. And it's a nectar and larval plant for many pollinators. And it's a great plant in general for a yard habitat. I have one that just planted itself in my yard somehow. That's getting really big and I love it. It's great. It's pretty thorny. I wouldn't walk too close to it, but I do see birds hanging out in it. They really like it. So ironwood is a, a native tree to this area. It's got the densest wood of any tree in the region. Really important pollinator support. Um, Roadrunners will nest in it. It's very dense, it's thorny, and it's a really shady tree. If you get towards the center of a uh, ironwood, it's very quite, it's quite shady in there. And it's important shade and cover for lizards and all sorts of animals. And it's a vital nursery plant for many other plant species, including sorrows. So the prickly pear is another one. Uh, it's very drought tolerant. The flowers and fruit are very important food source for pollinators, birds, and the others. Nesting shelter for quail root runners and others. And, and lizards will often shelter around a prickly pear. A prickly pear patch can be really important for them to shelter from predators, but also to hide from the sun. Because lizards need warmth and heat, but they can get overheated pretty easily. So they need access to different types of shade and stuff to, to stay the right temperature. Uh, Roadrunners also like water. Like everything else, um, they, they're not super tied to water, but they need water when it's really hot. So water's great. And they will use water to drink and cool off on the hottest days. And it helps make your whole yard really productive, which is what's gonna make it good for roadrunners. So I thought we could cover some of the lizards because the Greater Roadrunner recipe card covers um, some lizards on the front. It has a guide sort of to the six most common lizards in the Tucson area. And our innate tree lizard is gonna be one of the most commonly encountered, I would guess. Uh, they're very, very well camouflaged though. Each of these photos actually has a lizard in it, an ornate tree lizard. The one on the right is probably the most obvious because it's taken from the side, but their um, markings really help them blend in with, with uh, trees and rocks. And it's now been recently discovered that the females don't necessarily pick a male based on his physical traits or beauty, but she picks them on his territory. There's actually some birds that do this, where who, she'll find a really good territory find who's who's the male of like whose territory this is and then mate with him. So she's kind of choosing the territory. So then the males, of course, will fight over territory. So desert spiny lizard is a really, I think, commonly noticed lizard by people. They're, they're pretty big. They're really comfortable on the ground and rocks rather than on trees. So they're kind of easier to spot as they skitter across the ground. They often take shelter under rocks or in rodent burrows. They eat a lot of insects, spiders, centipedes, smaller lizards, and will occasionally eat plants. I've seen them munching on little leaves. And um, they're a very large lizard that gets noticed quite a lot. So zebra tail lizard is quick. If you've ever seen zebra tail, they're the ones who, uh, they have a long flat tail and it's zebra striped, it's black and white striped, real slender legs, they're really quick. 
They prefer a kind of open hard soil with a few plants. And when they're hanging out at rest, they'll wag that banded black and white tail kind of lazily left and right. And that's especially do that if, if, you've, if you've startled them up. So they feel a little bit threatened and they'll wave that tail. And that's meant to distract a predator. It's a predator defense so that it'll attack that tail and not the rest of their body. Because of course, many lizards can afford to lose a tail and survive. And they will much rather have a predator attack their tail and they can actually release the tail from their body. And the tail continues to wiggle while the lizard escapes. And uh, that's a, kind of a last resort predator um, escape strategy. So Sonoran spotted whiptail is another one that you can encounter here in your yard in, in the Tucson or you know, Southeast Arizona area. And they have six stripes along the body and an orange brown tail. And most whiptails are actually really cool. They're parthenogenic, which means they use asexual reproduction, which means they're all females and they produce by cloning themselves. So they will lay unfertilized eggs that hatch as females, young females that are just a clone of themselves, who then in turn, when they're older, can lay eggs that are clones of themselves. So really interesting strategy that's pretty rare in nature, but largely studied when you get these species where females can lay fertile eggs without, you know, viable eggs without a male around. And the whiptails are now exclusively female. So that's kind of cool. Kind of interesting drama happening in your yard. So greater earless lizard is another one that people encounter in um, the deserts of Southeast Arizona. Absolutely beautiful lizard, gorgeous, gorgeous lizard. And they're similar in size and shape. They're closely related to zebra tailed, but they're found at a slightly higher elevation. They'll also do that wave display of their tail to distract predators. They do a lot of small insects. And they'll actually spend the night buried in the sand. Um, I can show it at the end if people have questions, but I got a lot of this lizard information from this book, Lizards of the American Southwest. And it was uh, really, really interesting. I had this whole part about how greater earless lizards will bury themselves in the sand of washes. And if you take a walk in the early morning, you'll see them sometimes popping out from under the sand because <laughs> you're, you know, they feel the vibrations on the ground of you walking. So regal horn lizard uh, is another one that people can have in their yards. And I have had them in, um, in my yard in Rio Rico where they're really cool. So like the horn, the horn lizard, the one we tend to get in this area is regal horn lizard. There's lots of species though. And they are incredibly dependent on ants. They eat a lot of ants and they especially like harvester ants or leaf cutter ants. And it's up to 90% of their diet. They're very effective with camouflage. It's they're really hard to see unless they move. Uh, they're most active when it's warm, but not too hot, which is also when ants are most active. So there's a direct correlation there. They do need vegetation to hide under. So some of those shrubs we talked about like creosote, they need places to hide when it gets too hot. And they famously will squirt blood from their eyes. They don't do it very much. I've never actually seen them do it, but I've seen video of it. And that apparently is a defense specifically against canids, so against coyotes. And apparently that the substance they're shooting out of their eye, which is blood, but also with toxins in it, tastes awful to dogs and coyotes. So it's specifically against dogs and canids. So, um, Lizards need shelter. Shelter is very important for lizards. One of the most important things we can do for roadrunners is make our yards good for lizards. And lizards need places to hide. You can't make it too easy on the roadrunners to snag them. <laughs> uh, the roadrunners are very effective at getting them anyway, but lizards really do need places to shelter. And a rock pile is very good. A rock pile at the base of a tree is very good for arboreal lizards. And it also gives them safety, like places to hide, but it also gives them different temperatures, that they really need a variety of temperatures throughout the day to, to regulate their body temperature, because they, they are dependent on what's going on. Um, like they soak up their heat. They don't make their own, they have to get it from the, from the environment. And uh, rock piles can be a little more appealing to homeowners since they, they're not likely to attract rodents or anything like, like the sort of, or termites even. Now brush piles can and do are good homes for lots of birds sparrows and stuff will use them, rodents will use them. So if you have a property large enough where you can put a brush pile pretty far from your house, where you're not gonna have to worry about rodents getting into your house, they just kind of hang out at the brush pile far away from your house, a couple hundred yards from your house, that's perfect. Um, and brush piles are incredibly beneficial for soil health and all sorts of reasons. But if you have a smaller yard, a rock pile is a really good solution. It's really good for, for lizards and it doesn't really have any of those issues that brush piles can have. And just allowing your mesquites and desert trees to grow into a natural shape, sort of that lollipop, really almost really big bush round shape 
is very good for lizards and all sorts of wildlife really prefer these desert trees in their natural shape. So lizards also need food. They're very food focused. Um, and then of course, roadrunners are food, food focused on them, but lizards are also very food focused. And um, horned lizards do require harvester leaf cutter ants. And most lizards though will eat ants. So horned lizards have to have ants, but many other lizards will also snack on them. And turns out some species of ants will actually control termites, will actually attack and eat termites. Gramma grasses such as needle, needle gramma or like six weeks needle gramma, those are really great for ants, therefore good for lizards. And a bio-rich yard with native plants and native insects is great. That's really the key to getting lizards in your yard is one that's bio-rich. And uh, insecticides are absolutely a no-go. It kills the prey base and it can actually poison lizards. And Kim was telling me about how it really makes them, it can make them quite ill and affect their morning behavior. I do wanna give a quick shout out. A lot of these lizard tips and advice on how to get lizards in your yard, we did get from direct correspondence with the, the late great Phil Rosen from University of Arizona, who very generously gave us all this really Tucson specific, Southeast Arizona specific expert knowledge. Um, and sadly he did pass away in 2020, but it was really great that he was so generous and taught us so much about lizards uh, before that. So I just want to give a shout out to, to Phil for that really nice information he gave us. And up next, we got some, um, some information from Kim. Thanks, Jenny. Um, so I was just going to go over um, the actual recipe that's on the recipe card for inviting roadrunners to your yard. Um, so it's a bulleted list um, of pretty much um, any threats that roadrunners encounter um, and how to uh, quickly go over habitat building for them. Mostly Jenny covered most of it, but uh, we'll just go through. Next. Yeah, thanks. Uh, so you wanna keep cats indoors. Um, cats are the number one killer of birds in the United States, um, but they are also highly prone to killing mammals, lizards, um, and they also impact bio biodiversity in a number of ways. So obviously predation is the number one way they affect biodiversity. Um, they also have effects on animals by just their mere presence, so fear effects. So um, nesting birds are less, I think they said, less likely to feed their, go, go back to their nest, like, it decreased by a third of their nesting visits when a cat was present. Um, so they also compete. The competition impacts biodiversity. So the more lizards and small mammals these cats are eating, the less food hawks are getting, for example. So that's a big effect. Um, they also spread disease. Um, they can spread disease to mammals and reptiles. Um, and then also hybridization. So feral cats that are just free roaming often will or can breed with a wild cat, so like a bobcat. Um, so that can lead to, well, eventually it could lead to the extinction of, of wild cats in the long run. Um, yeah, so next. Go to the next slide, Jenny. Uh, so these are some stats um, of cats effects on different animals and just in the United States and within a year. So like I said earlier, uh, 1.3 to 4 billion birds are killed by feral cats each year, free roaming cats. Um, 6.3 to 22.3 billion mammals are killed each year. Uh, 258 to 822 million reptiles are killed each year. Uh, and then 95 to 299 million amphibians killed each year. And so they've been doing a lot of research mainly on birds and mammals. There's not a lot of research done on reptiles and amphibians yet, but from what I've seen, they're starting to actually do some good uh, research on reptiles affected by cats, especially in Australia. So hopefully in the next few years, some more research will come out on on actual numbers that are more precise. Um, some solutions, 
for cats. So if you own a cat that you let outside and to free range, um, you can instead put a catio on your patio. <laughs> okay. um, uh, supervised walks, you can put your cat on a leash and walk it. I know Jenny puts hers on a tether and watches it so that prevents them. And then there's also a lot of research that's been done about this clown collar looking thing. Um, some recent research actually, uh, it says that it helps for birds just because they can see those bright colors. Um, they did say that bells are not effective because the cats have learned how to, to mute the bells. And by the time the bird hears the bells, it's, it's too late. Um, and they are not effective on mammals. And there's no studies on if it's effective on reptiles at all. So the, the best ways to, to help with this problem is to just keep your cats indoors or confined in an area outdoors or, or just to be with them at all times. <laughs> Next. Uh, and then you wanna add thick thorny plants, which Jenny covered earlier for nesting. Next. Okay. And that's pretty much everything that Jenny said. So desert hackberry, um, gray thorn is also a good one that produces really nice berries that birds love as well. Really thorny and bushy <laughs> uh, prickly pear. Here's the Santa Rita variety, which is beautiful purple. Uh, Choya is the staghorn, uh, ironwood, and then creosote. Next. Uh, nesting, uh, they prefer three to 10 feet off the ground um, in horizontal branches or the crotch of sturdy bushes, um, mainly like this prickly pear. Uh, they like it well concealed and shaded and close to um, a path, like Jenny said, open area that they have open access to run, get their nesting materials, get their lizards to their babies. That's their nesting preferences. And then ground structures, these are just some pictures of um, rock piles. So these are ones that I've made with, there's a big bougainvillea when I moved into the house, we immediately tore that out. So that's the root system in the background, which is really great. Turns out to be really great for the lizards. I see them just perched on there a lot during the day. Um, and I always put leaf litter around it as well. When the leaves fall in the fall, I just kind of gather them up from the other areas and just dump them in there. So there's, I think there's another picture. Yeah, so that's in the fall on the left. And then I just took this picture yesterday um, of the picture on the right. I've just put in some um, passion vines because there's always caterpillars on that for lizards to eat. Um, so then in, in the summer, it kind of just grows up to be more vegetated and more protected since I don't have all that leaf litter there anymore. Um, and leave the leaves. Uh, so like I said, um, leaves are really important for insects to breed. So that's food for lizards. Um, and they also hibernate. Lizards will hibernate or overwinter under like thick piles of leaves. Um, so that helps them keep warm. Um, if I know there's a lot of issues with HOAs and keeping your yard tidy. So what I do is usually just rake up all the leaves and then I put them into a, one of the tree basins. Um, so they usually don't complain about that. And it's great for the soil. I also put clippings in there as well. Just cut them up like six inches, just throw all that the left picture is like my milkweed bed. So it's just a raised bed and I put all the leaves in there as well. So you get all these great little volunteers in there as well. So leave the leaves. And then open dirt patches. So lizards will nest in the ground three to four inches deep. So they need some loose soil to, to create their nests. Um, and then you could tell that it's a lizard nest because the opening is at a 45 degree angle. So they'll lay their eggs in there and then and cover them up. So having areas in your yard that aren't covered by gravel or have any sort of <clears throat> like plastic weed cloth is really important for not only lizards, but a lot of, a lot of insects. And then increase your patch size. Like Jenny said earlier, road runners require a larger range. So having your neighbors create Roadrunner habitat as well will help 
them come to your neighborhood and they can share the love between houses. So that's easy thing is just to promote what you're doing to your neighbors and then you can each do something different. Like if you are really interested in caterpillars, you could focus your yard on caterpillars. Someone else could focus on like hummingbird habitat. So just creating a community of habitats is really important for not only road owners, but all sorts of bird species, pollinators, um, yeah. Um, and then avoid pesticides. Yeah, so like Jenny said, uh, I was doing some research on direct effects of like neonics on lizards. And they just started looking at this just because they don't test um, pesticides on lizards as their species of concern. It's usually birds and mammals. But they are now starting to do research on lizards and it's not looking great. Um, then I was also looking at lizard like sprays and I don't know how I came across this. I wish I had it, but they're just sprays like Raid that you can use for lizards. And it was just says stuff like it won't kill out initially on the first spray. So I have to keep spraying it. It'll be a long death. So just like bag them up and, and just throw them away. And it just, I just could never imagine someone wanting to kill them, but people do. Um, and that is not a component of habitat. So please just avoid using any sort of pesticides. Next. Oh, that's it. All right, so I'm gonna stop sharing so you guys can speak with us. And I see the comment thing going bananas, but I haven't looked at it yet. So uh, let's see here. Oh, good. It's, it's mostly like. Oh, good. I have a cat too that I see going across my walls. So it's just spraying with water. That's a good idea. I usually took a slingshot and tried to hit it with a rock. Have work. you heard of the book, The Greater Roadrunner by James Cornett? Um, I will look for it. That's great. In fact, I'm going to cut and paste that right now. Yeah, those pictures of the babies, they really are so fantastic. Yeah, I, I can't believe the great photos Doris got and she's so generous in sharing that with us. Um, but I am more than happy for anyone to pipe up. If anyone has a question they wanna ask, uh, please do unmute yourself and jump on in there. Uh, Jenny, this is Paula in Marana. Hello. Hi, I'd love to meet that lady. I do nothing. My Roadrunner found me. Oh, great. <laughs> Have a good yard. Year. Oh, yeah. And on Easter, he brought a friend. Oh, God. Aww. And then last weekend, two days in a row, he went to my neighbor's yard, ate a lizard on my back fence, let me look at it. And the next, I had a little lizard that I would watch on my porch. Well, he got him on Sunday. Oh. Ate him yeah. right in front of me. I thought, you know, that is sickening. I mean, but yeah, I've, been, I've journaled this little road runner and i he i see him on our pathways i live in gladden farms but i've done absolutely nothing but when i took out three palm trees in my yard it left a runway on my road on my fence i have a, a, c, a cinder block fence he's sunned on it he runs he gets up on the roof um and that whoop 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 yeah, I hear it in about March and April. Oh, it's that's pretty, cool. Okay. But, oh, your talk has really filled in the gaps. <laughs> oh, God, I'm so glad. Yeah, that's great that you have not doing anything extra. I mean, the one behind me in the picture is the neighborhood guy. That's, oh, cool. oh, that's awesome. <laughs> I, I mean, I've finally just wrote a little book it's at the nature shop and the people have been real kind at the nature shop during birdathon to offer because i'm from colorado we don't see things like this i mean the birds don't get this close he's found me and he just likes my yard i guess i don't know i don't do anything it's rocked in so there's lizards every spring that's so, great he's got but he just likes the area. I, he will sometimes just sit on the back fence for almost an hour. But sure. the last, the day before Easter, 
he did something real strange and it wasn't covered in your talk. And I thought he was panting. Well, the next day when he brought a friend, I don't think that's panting. I think it was some kind of mating thing. I mean, you could see his little neck, you know, moving and I did a video of it. Okay. And, and I, see that. it was, it's on my phone. I don't know how to transfer it to you, but okay. it was the strangest thing. Was but he making then the sound? Next day, he brought a friend. He was on okay. the roof and the other one was on the ground. Hmm. Okay. Because I was just taking a picture to see, oh, I can get a good picture on the roof. And when I looked towards my right, there was another one. So, but I haven't found the nest in the area. So I wish I could. Doris is. It's, yeah, it's around. It's around. Yeah. Hiding them. If, if I may jump in, that panting is called guler fluttering. And okay. it has to do with the heat yeah. when it's very okay. hot. And all birds, yeah. I think all, or maybe I should say most birds do this. When it gets really hot, they flutter their um, uh, throat. And as the air comes in and out, it cools them. Okay, then it was panting. house sparrows do it very noticeably. When house sparrows do it, like in a, in a hot parking lot sitting in the shade, it's okay. pretty noticeable because they'll literally open their bill and that's right, they fluctuate the, the skin on their throat. It's, it's like, it's yeah. the same function as panting. That's exactly what it was. Well, I thought, shoot, I put water in the yard, you know, I, mm -hmm. you know, but he, he did it for 45 minutes. I timed him. Mm -hmm. He's just trying to lower his body. It's like when we sweat, we're just trying to lower our body temperature. Okay, yeah. okay. Mm. Yeah, cool. That's great. So I see a good question here in the chat of do roadrunners predate on other birds' eggs? I, I believe so. Yes, I've certainly seen them predate on quail chicks <laughs> in a big way. But, um, but, but So do they eat quail babies as yeah. well? Yeah. If they okay. I Because I, I had a quail mama hatch 12 babies and the roadrunner was running across. We've got a pair and they were running across the patio back and forth. But this Aww. this quail mama was in a spider plant that was hanging off the ground and the, the roadrunner never registered there was anything there. Well, good. All the babies uh, since hatched, they all jumped out of, the, out of this hanging pot onto the ground. The papa rounded them up and they took off. Good. Yay. Sure. Yay. Yeah, they might be more trouble than they're worth. Yeah, but they, they will... <laughs> They're just sort of uh, opportunistic hunters, right? They'll take anything they can encounter. And I don't think they go necessarily looking to raid nests the way like jays and crows will. But if they encounter baby birds in a nest and there's nothing stopping them from taking them, sure they will. It's like, like with lizards. They'll just take anything they can they can grab. Well, I saw a white wing dove. But it's, it's just ruthless. It's just a very ruthless. I, I saw a white wing dove years ago. There was a mama dove on a, in a choya nesting and she had a a standoff with a roadrunner for about two hours and she did not retreat. And he wow. eventually gave up and, gave up and, and left. Awesome. Good, yeah, see these parent birds try their best and they, they know that roadrunners are a threat. Anyone who they are a threat to is gonna know it. And it's gonna do what they can to stop them. So that's, yeah, that's great. Let's see, was there any other questions I missed? Does anybody have any additional questions? Okay. I'm glad you covered lit cats, Kim. That was an important one because my neighbor had a cat that would just kill so many lizards. I couldn't believe it. And she was an indoor outdoor cat. She was fed and cared for. She wasn't hungry. She was just one of those cats that, that entertains herself. And she was like a specialist in lizards and she would kill so many lizards in my yard. And once she was gone, suddenly I started getting lizards again and like big ones. Cause I never had big ones. Cause as soon as I got big, she'd get them. And once Calypso, the lovely cat, she was a very friendly cat, but man, she was such a, a plague on lizards in our in our group of yards right there. And they really are a big problem. They kill so much wildlife and lizards. Yeah. It's, it's like instinctual and they don't and they'll hunt even when they're not hungry. So it's just and Kim's quite right. I take my cat on a leash. I have her heart. <laughs> such a killer. So she I I don't have I have rent, so I can't build a catio. So I have her on a leash and I put the end of the leash in a drawer by the front door and she has a six foot radius by the front door that she can sunbathe and dust bathe and and watch the birds but can't get them kind of thing so taking steps to if your cats have to go outside like my cat wouldn't tolerate being fully indoors she kept escaping so that's the compromise we worked with her since she was a kitten and uh, she's pretty well trained on the leash now and we can kind of walk her around on it but doing what you can to prevent 
the needless deaths of wildlife at the paws of your cat is really a really important, meaningful step we can all take to, to prevent um, damage to the environment, to wildlife. Okay, Any, uh, any anything else out there from, uh, from you guys? Well, thank you so much. You really were a terrific audience. I really appreciate um, all of your help. Thank you all so much for, for coming here to this talk today. And I don't know if you have any final words, Kristen? Nope, that's about does it. Just um, thank you all so much. And we hope to see you back here again for another event. This recording will be posted uh, either today or tomorrow on our YouTube page. So feel free to rewatch or send it to folks who, who couldn't be here. And we hope to see you again in another event. Thanks again to Jenny and Kim as well for that wonderful presentation. Thanks everyone. All the recipes, thank you. All the recipe cards are in the shop. Yes. They're all free. So if you want to come oh, get free. some okay. for friends or for your neighbors or anything, uh, that we have them in the shop, please come by and get them. We printed, okay. got a grant. We printed a whole lot of these. There's 10 different ones. Um, okay. Please come okay, get them. They're free for the taking in the nature shop. And we bring them to events and stuff too, but they're okay. absolutely in the shop. And then Thank you. Thank the you. digital ones are also available Ooh. on the website in case you're not a uh, local to Tucson. I always forgot that. Yes, they're also yeah. PDFs, digital versions. These are on our website. Hmm. Thank All right. You. Thanks, everyone. Thank Have a good rest of your Thank day. You. Great Thank you. Thank you. Excellent. Bye.